south and as it clears away we're back into that mixture of sunshine and just a few showers with highs 12 to 20 degrees. Charlene Rachel. Thank you very much Carol. Time now is 7.48. We're going to talk about Paul Newman now, Hollywood icon of course, who appeared on the face to have it all. The looks, the awards, loving family, even built a food empire with its own pasta sauce and salad dressing. In fact, he was dogged by anxiety, insecurity and painful memories, which he laid bare in a half-finished memoir. And that story has now been finally published with the help of his daughter, Melissa. We'll be speaking to her in just a moment. Here, though, a first, a reminder for Dad's remarkable life. <laughs> Hombre means man, and Paul Newman is hombre. I'm looking to get myself killed, so pay attention. Well, Melissa Newman joins us now. I'm sure you can probably see the family resemblance. It's wonderful to have you here with us. And you were just commenting on, on some of the pictures that, yeah. that you saw there. Does it still kind of give you a little bit of a flutter when you look at pictures like this of your dad's career? Um, I have to say that going down, there's going down a rabbit hole every time you, mm. if you type my parents' name into, a, into the Google machine, um, <laughs> which says a lot about how I feel about technology. <laughs> Um, you, it's a rabbit hole. You could be there for six hours. Yeah. I see every single time I do it, I see photographs I've never seen before. Um, it's extraordinary, but both my parents. It's, they're, they're so beautiful, you know. Is it a difficult thing, Melissa? Because we all have our, we from the outside have these images of, right. of, of your right. father. And you know him as a dad. You, you know, you don't know him as a, a Hollywood movie star. Is it, is it difficult having us kind of inspecting your life in a way when we don't know anything? Um, well, it's, you know, it's, it's inspecting his life, which is interesting. And I, I was thinking about this, that, you know, I'm being asked to be an authority on my parents. And I thought, well, who is a, an authority on their parents, really? You know, when people say... What was it like? What was your father like? I always say, well, what was your father like? <laughs> um, you know, they were, they were my parents. I'm an authority on being their child, you know. There are movies of theirs that I haven't seen. Deliberately or just you haven't got around to it because the catalog there are a is lot. so... Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, I literally cool. have movies in my future that I'm excited to see, but, but also somewhat melancholy. That's why it's yeah. a little sad at this point to sit down and watch them. I but, can imagine. Yeah. But the whole point about the book, though, is that it, it will reveal a side to him that people will not know. Yeah. And it's quite raw in that respect, yes. isn't it? Yes, it is... Um, you know, I always say that there, there are so many books in these transcripts. There are so many transcripts... And um, you could write 12 books and a play and, a, you know, you could because do all sorts it, of He things. was collating um, experiences of other people in his life about him and his life and his works. And then I think began what putting down his own stories, but orally about his, his life and experiences. Is that right? Yeah, it's important to remember that this is an oral document. And, um, and the interviewer, Stuart Stern, was an incredibly close friend of the family, uh, my middle name is Stuart. My son's middle name is Stuart. He was he became ordained as a minister so he could marry my husband and I. So he was a wonderful, magical person. Stuart Stern is someone worth worth looking up. Um, and he was close to the family. 
And I, I think it's interesting that it, I was thinking about the fact that um, in the book you'll find that my father's mother objectified him because he was beautiful. And in a way I think Stuart objectified him and imbued him with all this intellectual and artistic prowess that my father didn't feel he had. And, um, and so you have Stuart asking these very probing questions and my dad answering and sometimes sounding a bit punchy in his answers. And I could always tell when he was getting annoyed because in the transcripts you'll see he'll say, Stuart, I didn't feel any of those things. <laughs> and, and, um, but Stuart was really good at digging. So um, they, you know, since Stuart was sort of removed from that, it's kind of interesting to think. He, my father wasn't sitting down at a typewriter. Mm -hmm. he was, if he had written this, it would have been very different. Mm -hmm. So these are really oral transcripts. It, it is nonetheless, and I think you alluded to it a moment ago, the areas, there are difficult areas, I would imagine, yeah. for you said you can only tell the story as a child. Yeah. There are difficult areas, aren't yeah. there? Um, one being his drinking, yes. which I certainly, uh, you know, why, why would we know about that? But it, yeah. it, was, it was almost a constant throughout his life, wasn't it? For, for, and, and he saw it as very debilitating in some ways. And then also, he, he was very anxious about his role as a father. Yes. And how, how well he did as a father, which I, I would imagine seeing your own father writing that down would be difficult. Um, well, having, because I have children, <laughs> really reading about that isn't that such, it isn't such a surprise. I mean, you know, once you have children, you understand how they don't come with instructions. And, um, you know, nobody is deemed, you know, knighted to be a parent. Um, what was the first question you asked was about... It was about the alcohol. And, the alcohol. And, you know, the impact that had on, on life and family. And yeah. I, um, I would say what was, what was kind of frustrating was that um, he was incredibly high-functioning. He was also a man who was always known to be on time, ready, you know, ready, knew his lines. That's why everybody loved to work with him. Um, and so um, that, you know, that really made it difficult to call him out. And, um, it, you know, it made him distant. Uh, as a, He became better and better, so by the time I, we bought the house, I live in the house I, I, I lived in when I was a child. They bought it in 1961, the year I was born. So the house you grew up in? The house I grew up in. I feel like a docent <laughs> with the best family photos. Same furniture, different slipcovers. Um, but so the last 12 years were really spent with babies and barbecues. They moved to my grandmother's house across the river with a footbridge and a river and we had children running back and forth in barbecues. And really by the time he got to the point of being a grandparent, you know, he evolved. He evolved. And after this was my little sister, Clea, points out that this was really a moment in time when he kind of, and I think all this introspection was was tricky. Can I ask you about the, the impact that Paul Newman had on a room? I, I, I once interviewed Robert Redford uh, many years ago, 2013 I think it was, and yeah. it, I, I, that was the first time I'd witnessed that, Robert yeah. Redford, and then yeah. you know you're going to meet him and then there he is. Yeah. You must have seen that firsthand a million times. Uh. And <laughs> what was that like? Well, uh, you know, as a family, as a family member, um, I think this is also interesting because the producer, Emily Wachtel, who produced the doc, both the documentary that's out about them and also really made this book happen and found the, um, she found the transcripts. Um, well, w I knew the transcripts were up in, a, up in a cabinet, some of them, but by the time, she's the one who got the key and actually got them out and started reading them and decided that it should be a book. Um, you have to remind me what the question was. It's the early. impact Paul Newman had when he walked Walking into two rooms. So she grew up with our family um, as well and is also an amazing producer. Um, so, she, you know, she understood why these transcripts were important to put out into the world. Him walking into a room, sitting at a table with him when I was a child. I mean, there were times we were at hotels. You couldn't leave the hotel, the paparazzi. It's really... Um, I think when you just want to be an actor... I think when you want to be a star, maybe it's different, but when you really just want to be an actor, that's doubly, doubly annoying. So, you know, we'd be sitting at dinner and, you know, mostly women would come up to, come up to my mother and say, can I kiss him? <laughs> you know, and I give my mom credit for not slugging somebody. But actually, that's, that's one thing that is worth talking weird. about as well, because one of the other sort of narratives of the book is that, that the enduring love between your... Uh, oh, yeah. And your mom is still around, yeah. I know, but that must be 
something that's actually very special and uplifting to, to remember and think about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think the thing that you find out in the book is how complicated it was. And I think that people were so interested in this, um, the fairy tale narrative of the perfect marriage in Hollywood for 50 years. You know, and anybody just who's married needs to just think about that for half a second and knows that, that, that there's no way that could be true. And, you know, doubly complicated because of fame and, and you know, so through, we sort of felt like people clung to this fairy tale, even though the other information was really out there, but they clung to the fairy tale. And, um, and but, you know, as people started to forget about them, which is why we engaged in making these projects, um, we decided that maybe it made more sense if they're going to disappear anyways to bring them back in a more manner which we think is really more relevant to people to see that, you know, that that gloss is just a gloss. But they were, they were the, the thing I find most fascinating about them is this inexorability of their, you know, I always say that I really felt like he, she was the only one he wanted in the room at the end. You know, that lasted forever. He found her endlessly fascinating and also loved directing her. Spent his, I'm sorry, I'm, I ramble. Uh, spent his whole life, um, you know, trying to find projects to direct her and, you know, um, show, the, show the rest of the world how extraordinary she was. That's an incredible thing yeah. to people to have. Yeah. Uh, it is a compelling read. And if for anyone yeah. who has any interest in films, uh, you know, there's so much detail in there, apart from anything else, just about the work yeah. and all that stuff. Lovely to see you this morning. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. So Paul Newman's memoir is called The Extraordinary Life of an Ordinary Man. Headlines coming up in just a moment. Shall we?